Today I was talking with someone who said in passing that sitting and meditating when your mind is a, is a mess and all over the place is a waste of time. And of course that's not true. At the very least, it gives you an opportunity to look at what a messed up mind is like. And maybe with enough time you'll get tired of it and want to do something about it. I've often found that one way of jump-starting your practice is to make up your mind you're going to sit for a certain amount of time every day and really stick with it. And you may find in the beginning that your meditation is miserable and you don't like it. But if you stick with that set amount of time every day, there comes a point where you have to say, hey, look, as long as I'm sitting here, I might as well do this right. Because sometimes you have to corner the mind that way. before it begins to shape up. Another consideration, of course, is that we're sitting here with your eyes closed. You're not doing anything harmful to anybody. You're not engaging in wrong speech. You're not engaging in wrong action or wrong livelihood. And that's not a small thing. So at the very least, you're keeping yourself from causing harm. The teachings on right action, I very rarely mention them in the talks here, because while you're sitting here, nobody is killing anybody, nobody's stealing, nobody's engaging in illicit sex, unless you're doing that in your mind. But it's important every now and then to think about it, why right action is part of the path. To begin with, it grows out of right view and right resolve. You realize that your actions are important in thought and word and deed, and you don't want anything do anything that's going to be harmful either to yourself or to other people. And these are three of the things that the Buddha singled out as always harmful. And unlike right speech, all three of the forms of wrong action. Find a place in the five precepts, i.e. basic practice for everybody. You don't kill anybody, any animal that you can see or that's big enough for you to see. You don't steal anything. You don't engage in illicit sex, period. Again, these are vows that you take for yourself. And they're right in the sense that they're skillful. If you don't cause harm to yourself, you don't cause harm to other people. They benefit, you benefit, and it makes it a lot easier to meditate. And it cuts off a lot of unskillful thinking when you realize, well, I just can't do that. can't engage in that kind of action, so why even think about it? That helps put up a wall. Now, many times we think of a wall as a restriction, but here the, the wall is protection. Because there are lots of easy ways where the mind could start justifying actions of this sort. One of the reasons the precepts are so short and clear-cut is that they're especially important when you start finding reasons that you would want to break them. When your life is in danger, the life of your loved ones is in danger, you have to remind yourself, no killing. Now you can do what you can to stop the danger, short of killing, but no killing. And so on down the line. Because these forms of wrong action are also related to the hindrances. And as the Buddha pointed out, when a hindrance is particularly strong, like the desire to get engaged in sensual desire or sensual passion, or when you're feeling thoughts of ill will, restlessness, and anxiety. You don't recognize the fact that those thoughts are unskillful. That's one of the main problems. 
and having the precepts remind you these really are unskillful, no matter what, no matter where. So that stops you short. It's a red flag for you to know, okay, this kind of behavior is out of the question. And at the same time, you can, as with right speech, you can think of right action as guidelines for your meditation. On one level, it, as I said, it refers to the hindrances. When you think, okay, no killing, that relates directly to the, the hindrance of ill will. No stealing, no illicit sex, those relate to the well, depending on your motivation for stealing, it could relate to ill will, it could also relate to sensual desire, your desire to have this or that thing. Or you may steal simply because you're angry at somebody, you want to deprive them of something. Again, ill will. And illicit sex. Again, that can be motivated either by ill will or desire. So it focuses on the two big hindrances. To remind you that you don't want to go there. Because if you're going to get the mind into good, solid concentration, you have to get beyond, as I said, be secluded from sensual passion, be secluded from unskillful mental qualities. These are two of the big ones. And even further, John Lee takes the teachings on right speech and right action, he makes them more symbolic of other things that go on in the mind when you're meditating as well. Killing, for instance. You don't want to kill your goodness. Where does your goodness come from? Well, it comes from being heedful. As the Buddha said, when you're heedless, you're as if you're dead. You're killing yourself. You're killing the goodness of the mind. If you feel, well, there's nothing much I have to do. Everything is perfectly fine as it is. I don't have to work out putting any effort in the path, well, that kills you right there, kills the practice. So you want to make sure you don't kill your practice, you don't want to kill your goodness. You've got to be heedful at all times. Even though this means having a strong sense that, okay, what you're doing is important right now. And you don't know how much longer you're going to have to do anything skillful. You've got to Develop as many skillful habits as you can, which means you have to do them right now. The Buddha once talked about having the monks develop mindfulness of death as a, as a useful form of meditation. And the different monks talked about how they developed it. Someone said, I think every day, may I live at least one more day so I can practice the, medit the Buddha's teachings and I'll get and they'll be able to get a lot out of it. Another monk says, well, I think that every half day. May I live another half day? And so on down the line until I got to two monks. One who said, I think may I live to breathe in and out once more. Another monk who said, well, I'm eating. May, may I breathe long enough to the amount of time it takes to eat a mouthful of food. So in that amount of time, I'll try to do as much skillful practice as I can, and I'll get good results that way. And the Buddha said only those last two monks really count as being heedful. So here you are meditating. You've got the chance, to, at least with this breath, as it comes in and goes out, to develop something skillful. That's, way, that's the way you avoid killing your meditation, killing your goodness. As for stealing, as John Lee says, it means stealing the affairs of other people, thinking about how that person is no good and this person is no good. He says you never really ask them permission to think about their bad habits their bad features. So it's like stealing their stuff. And then what kind of stuff are you stealing? As he says, you're stealing their garbage. If you're going to steal things from other people, think about the good points of other people. At least that gives you some energy. Remember that analogy the Buddha gives of the person coming across the desert, tired, thirsty, trembling with the heat thirsting for water and finding a little bit of water in a cow's footprint. And you realize, okay, here I am tired and thirsty and trembling, I need that water. But if I try to scoop it up with my hand, I'll get the water all muddy. So you go down and you very carefully slurp up the water straight from the cow print. 
your need for the goodness of other people is that extreme. Because if all you can see is the bad features of other people, you're going to lose your enthusiasm for doing good. You say, well, as long as everybody else is cheating, I might as well cheat as well. That, that's a very common thought that you see throughout society. Again, that kills your goodness. So you don't want to steal other people's bad, bad traits. Think of the good traits of other people. Think about the great Ajans. Think about Abhasika Gi. People who gave their life to the practice and have done so much for the world as a result. I mean, you can do that too. There's nothing about them that's superhuman. You think about their good habits, maybe you can think about how they might have solved a problem that you're facing right now. That gives you energy. So as the John Lee says, as long as you're going to steal something, steal their, steal their valuables. Don't steal their garbage. But ultimately you want to get to the point where you're more of a self-starter. You can draw on your own inner resources. And what are your inner resources? We've got the four, four properties of the body here. You've got the breath. You can develop that. You've got good mental states. Develop those. Develop your own resources. And you find that you've got all the inner wealth you need. You don't need to steal anything from anybody else, good or bad. And as for the precept against illicit sensuality, that's what it says, gamesu. Again, this relates to sensual desires. You don't want to get anywhere near them while you're sitting here and meditating. Because you think every sensual passion, every sensual desire comes with a price. The Buddha has a long list of analogies. He says it's like a dog gnawing on a bone that has no meat. Or a person carrying a, a torch against the wind, and the flame of the torch is coming, is going to burn you if you don't throw down the torch. It's like using borrowed goods. The sensual pleasures you get from other people, they can take them away at any time. Another analogy is like a man up in a tree gathering fruit. And somebody else comes along and says, well, I can't climb the tree, but I've got my axe. I can cut down the tree. If the first man doesn't get out of the tree, he's going to, he's going to get hurt pretty badly. And again, someone else may come along and take the sources of your sensual pleasures very easily. So you're putting yourself in a dangerous position when you indulge in sensuality. Sometimes you hear of the dangers of jhana, that you're going to get stuck in jhana, and it's going to be so enthralling and so wonderful that you're not even going to want to gain awakening. And you can find a couple of passages in the canon that make that point. But that's a very small danger compared to the dangers that come from being attached to sensuality. As the Buddha said, this is why we have wars, this is why we have quarrels. This is why people work themselves to death. This is why they steal and cheat in their desire for sensuality. I don't know of anybody who has broken the five precepts because they're attached to the pleasure of jhana. So jhana is the safe place. Sensuality is the dangerous place to be. Always keep that in mind. In this way you take the principles of right action and you bring them inside. So that you have your own inner wealth that you can build on. There's no need to steal anything from anyone else. There's no need to put yourself in the dangers of trying to find your happiness outside. And by being heedful in this way, you keep your goodness alive. And that's the most important possession you can have.